Well, greetings, imagination connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your master of fun and wonder, your viceroy of verisimilitude, and as John Campia calls me, your existential Mr. Rogers, Robert Meyer Burnett, and welcome to another episode of Mailbag. For the John Campia Show, I am your host, Robert Meyer Burnett, and let's just get right into it. We're going to start with Garden Variety Vagabond. Sends in a tip and says, per CNET, not per snickety, but per CNET, Lucasfilm hired a deep fake YouTuber whose impressive video showing his own de-aging of Skywalker went viral. Shamook announced last year he'd been hired as a senior facial capture artist. Lucasfilm confirmed the new hire. Well, let me just tell you, uh, judging by what he did in the penultimate episode of the Book of Boba Fett, um, my God, he did an amazing job, which is great. I mean, with the technology that's available. See, kids, you work hard at something, and uh, you'll get discovered too. But no, he's a very talented guy. I think it's pretty cool, and we reap the benefits. No one can say, like, well, Rob, you know, uh, Luke wasn't very, uh, when he shows up at the end of uh, Mandalorian Season 2, he's not very impressive. Now, even I was like, wow, that's pretty jaw-dropping. Uh, well done. So, good for him. That's good. Daki says, part one, hey, John, or Rob, I was just thinking that Death on the Nile must be the most cursed film in the COVID era. With the issues of Army Hammer and both Letitia Wright and Russell Brand having anti-vax stances, the latter of which has hard lined on them. Part two, and the multi multi bumps on release dates, all of which aren't production related or issues during the filming. I can only imagine how Brana feels. At least he's got Belfast. Well, let me just tell you, as a filmmaker who's worked on films a lot longer than they should have taken, it 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 can be incredibly frustrating. So you're not wrong. And the whole thing with Army Hammer, I mean, it's such a weird thing. You know, you hire somebody to do work. And yet we now conflate everyone's private lives with their professional lives. And it's a very difficult, hard place to be in because, you know, human beings are imperfect people. None of us will hold up to close scrutiny depending on how close it's going to be. But yes, I think Kenneth Branagh had to put up with a lot, especially because, you know, Murder on the Orient Express went really, really well. So I can only imagine how frustrating it must be. But this weekend, we are in fact getting the film, which is cool, so I'm happy for all involved. Daki goes on to say, can you think of a film that has had as many non-production related issues that has mired it before its release? I can't think of, I mean, I can't think of, I, obviously, All the Money in the World, the Ridley Scott film, which actually replaced Kevin Spacey with Christopher Plummer. I mean, that was pretty, pretty insane, but they did it very quickly. Um, I can't believe that even got finished. Obviously, Death on the Nile, they couldn't have replaced Army Hammer because it's a um, ensemble piece, so it'd be difficult to deal with. But other than that, I I don't think I can think of anything like that, unless you go all the way back to, like, Cleopatra, but that's a story unto itself. And for those of you who want to see a crazy Hollywood story, watch uh, Kevin Burns' documentary on the making of Cleopatra. It's really amazing. Thomas, DM, sends in one of six... Hey, John and team, I've been following your show for some time, and I like it so much, it's quickly become a part of my daily routine. I live in Belgium, and every day I look forward to watching it while I cook dinner. You've assembled a truly amazing team. Thank you. And I can safely say that you've helped me get through some dark times over the course of this pandemic, so I wanted to thank you for that. With that in mind, my question is all about Apple TV+. Plus, The service turned two a couple of months ago. And I have to say, it is now by far my favorite plat platform I have access to. Unlike others, it doesn't have a back catalog of content, so it started with very little, but almost every single show and the movies they introduce piques my interest. Well, that's good. Uh, their content feels cohesive and curated in a way that Netflix just really doesn't. It's not to say that everything is great on Apple TV+. Plus. Looking at you, Invasion. Oh, my God, dude. Dude. I was so excited for Invasion. And I've never seen... That was the slowest alien invasion ever. And I... Look, as I've said, I'm an easy lay for an, an alien invasion story. Give it to me. Give it to me. 
I will watch. But man, I mean, they spend a bunch of time with kids from a school bus trapped in a hole or a pit or whatever you want to call it. I'm like, really? The world's being invaded and we're here with these kids in a hole? I know. Uh, but for me, it's definitely more hit than miss. Everyone loves Ted Lasso, but my absolute favorite is bro for all mankind, says Thomas DM. It takes a few episodes to get going. It does. But then it turns into an utterly amazing character-driven show with mind-blowing personal and political stakes and intensity. And the second season finale... I Just before I read your comment, I just want to say, Thomas DM, the second season finale of For All Mankind is one of the greatest hours of television, certainly of the last 20 years. So you, sir, are not wrong. <laughs> Let me just go... And the second season finale might just be the best episode of any show I've seen in years. Anyway, I wanted to know your general thoughts on Apple TV+. Plus. Have you seen For All Mankind? Also, Thomas DM, where'd you go? Where? Uh, 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 uh. Well, I don't see you there. Also, I don't know what your also is. I'll get to it. Also, oh, because I'm an idiot. Also, I just saw that they have a limited series with Samuel L. Jackson coming next month and another one with Gary Oldman in April. <coughs> Apparently, I forgot how to do this. Uh, Thomas, I have to say, first of all, great minds think alike. You and I, we're on the same page. We are simpatico, sir. Um, I have to say, as a space freak, I'll watch anything to do with real space or science fiction space, and I love the American Space Program and the ESA, the European Space a Agency. Uh the, the Chinese space program, Taikonauts, uh, Cosmonauts. I'll watch anything to do with man or humanity's foray into space. So for all mankind, I mean, you know, at first I was like, okay, I'm skeptical. I got Apple Plus because of For All Mankind. And I didn't watch the first season until the second season was available. Dude, I binged that stuff. It is amazing. And for those of you who don't know, the the cast of that show is incredible. The stories are incredible. And yeah, it's can be kind of a slow burn. I would say not just the final episode, which was unbelievable, but the the last two episodes of season two, man, that the the penultimate episode, the second to the last episode, the way it ended, my God, it was incredible. And you know what? The morning show and a lot of the other things they're doing, they're really good shows. Ted Lasso, of course, like you mentioned, I think you're absolutely right. It's pretty great. So I'm down. I'm down with you. I think you're absolutely right. I want to thank you for supporting the channel the way you do. But, man, For All Mankind is so great. I cannot wait. So for those of you who don't know, at the end of every episode, of uh, or episode every um, season of For All Mankind, there's a pretty big time jump, and there is at the end of season – uh, two. And I have to say, not only was 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 the finale of season two of For All Mankind amazing, but the final shot was incredible. Incredible. And I don't think I've ever said that about a TV show before, but it was amazing. Geek Pool says, hey there, John and crew. I wanted to know if you watched Hit Monkey on Hulu yet. I have not seen it, but I've talked to people who like it. Uh, a good friend of mine who's a big comic book fan says Hit Monkey's pretty good. I haven't seen it. And also, what you thought of it. I loved it myself. Great Marvel lore with Japanese Marvel characters, and it portrayed the origin story of Hit Monkey in the best way. Well, based on your uh, recommendation, I'm going to watch Geek Pool because why not? It sounds good. Anonymous sends in one of two. Uh, John, Rob, Aaron, Chris, Ray, I just want to say thank you for providing such a great place for me to be informed, enlightened, and entertained. Well, I take full credit. No, I can't do that. As you know, it's a team effort. And John sets the tone. I've watched your shows daily since the AMC days, and they have helped me get through some very tough years. Uh, one of two, where's Anonymous? You know what? I'm going to say that perhaps you are, uh, you are Zachary Zarvos. I'm excited to say that I'm in a feature film called Yucca Fest, premiering at the Chinese Theater on March 3rd. Not only this, but I was accepted into the United States Marine Corps at the age of 30. Semper Fi. Oh, my God, Zachary, that's amazing. And I will be in boot camp this Sunday for the next three months. I appreciate everything you've done, and you've inspired me to be a better person. See you May 6th. 
when I graduate basic training and earn the title of United States Marine. Dude, first of all, in advance, thank you for your service. Second of all, okay, how cool is it that you're going to be able to say at 30, you're a Marine? You know what? You never have to give up your dreams. You can follow it is what you want to do. You never have to give up. Semper Fi, do or die. Good for you, sir. By the way, Zachary, I'd love to hear uh, how how did that go? What was it like? What was it like doing basic training? I, I think about, I, I hark back to the character of, uh, well, Walter, Walter Kurtz, Marlon Brando's character from Apocalypse Now. Not that I'm comparing you to him, but he did uh, special forces training late in life. He was even older than you. So pretty cool, Zachary. Um, I'm sure you and your loved ones are quite proud of what you're doing, and so are we at the John Campia Show. But I'd love to hear back from you. What is the experience of basic like, especially at 30? Was it different? Did people call you old man? I mean, I'm old, and I'm way older than you, but my God, wouldn't it, what a great experience. I mean, even, even at my advanced age that I'm close to death, I kind of, the idea of going through a boot camp like, like Marine boot camp appeals to me. I, I would love to know, love to hear back from you. So tell us. C sends in a tip and says, hi, all. Are any of you watching the Prime series Reacher? And what have you thought of what you've seen? Failing that, are you fans of either the Tom Cruise movies or books? And how? And do you have any anticipation for the show? Well, see, I've watched all of Reacher. I am a huge Lee Child fan. He, of course, has written all the Reacher books. Killing Floor was his first Reacher novel. Now, they brought in some elements like Neely. They, they brought in elements from later books that they incorporated, like Reacher's extended family, which I thought was a really good choice. I really loved it. Sure, there's a lot of kind of television tropes. I get it. I understand. But I I loved it. I thought it was great. And I've read the books. I like the Tom Cruise movies. I like the first one, McCory's movie, a little bit better. Still, respectable films. I, I enjoyed them. Like, I did. I thought it was good. Mumra sends in a tip and says, would the crew or Anne like to see a young Miyagi series that shows his father teaching him Miyagi-Do, fighting off his own bullies with friend Sato joining the military, losing his wife and kid during childbirth, and the fallout with Sato after the Cobra Kai, after Cobra Kai raps? Yes. I think that's a great, what a great idea to do a, a Miyagi prequel series. Bring that on. Love it. Kevin Kamaki sends in a tip and says, what are you looking forward to most in the Lord of the Rings show? The world building, I want to see, obviously, Middle Earth is not the same in the Second Age as it is in the Third Age. I'm looking forward to seeing how they portray Sauron and how all that works, to be honest, and and all the characters. The one thing about um, the Lord of the Rings, the, the, the Rings of Power, is that those characters are all sort of drawn. I mean, they've mentioned them, but they don't have a voice. You can't, like, read dialogue and adapt that di dialogue Tolkien had, had written. So I'm really curious to see how they're going to do all that. Hopefully it's great. I I have I have high hopes. We'll see if it's good or not. Downey Downey Jr. sends in a tip and says, over or under Avatar 2 makes more than $120 million opening weekend. Screen Rant mentioned that it's a guaranteed box office success. And how close do you guys think it'll get to the first Avatar overall? And have you guys seen Ghosts on Peacock? It's really good. One, I haven't seen Ghosts. I, look. Everyone always wants to get a bet against James Cameron. You know, it's taken, it's been since, what, 2009? So it's been, this is the longest stretch we've gone without James Cameron since James Cameron came on the scene. I mean, I know people are going, oh, Rob, he directed Piranha 2, The Spawning, and he did the effects for Escape from New York and Battle Beyond the Stars and Galaxy of Terror. I get that. But from Terminator on, Terminator was 84, Aliens was 86, The Abyss was 88, uh, the director's cut of The Abyss was like, what, 91? And then we got True Lies. And then he produced movies like Strange Days and uh, Soderbergh's Solaris. And then he made Titanic, which was, what, 97? And Avatar. Never bet against James Cameron. Never do it. Don't do it. I think it's going to be a success. I think Cameron's going to give us something that's going to be something we haven't seen before. I'm looking forward to it, man. I, I, To be honest, I can't wait. Gary Phillips sends in a tip and says, Hey, John and crew. Hope everyone is doing fantastic. What are your predictions for the season finale of Book of Boba Fett? And have a blessed day. Well, my predictions were that I wouldn't hate it as much as I did. Like I said on the show, I thought it was McClunky. I didn't like it. Uh, first of all, I'll tell you, in a nutshell, 
I liked everything that happened in it, like all the the different events, and I loved seeing Mando and Boba fighting together in the air and on the ground. But to me, it was just a big bag of dumb. And and I say that because look, if you are an outgunned, an outmanned, ragtag team defending your position in a place like Mos Espa, uh. Black, don't put Blacker Stanton standing in the middle of the street with his heavy weapons and expect him not to get picked off. Why aren't you guys in hiding? Why aren't you? Why don't you have sniper positions? Look, if you're going to make a show about somebody, a wannabe crime lord, you have to emulate other crime lord story, crime lord stories. That's the whole point. Star Wars has always been based on something else, whether it's Kurosawa or whether it's the Dam Busters. It's, it's a heady mix of things that we've already seen from the our real world transposed into a galaxy a long time ago, far, far away. And uh, how many crime stories have we seen? Hell, if I was going to make the book of Boba Fett, I would have made him Christopher Walken and emulated King of New York. I know people are like, wait, what? That's a movie directed by Abel Ferrara. Just watch it. Or, or go back and look at Goodfellas or Heat. And I look at Book of Boba Fett, and I'm like, I don't believe the, I don't believe Boba Fett. Why you got to be a jobber, as John would say? It wasn't. Uh, I wanted it to be better than it was. I was very disappointed. Stomach Shave says, "Do you think that Episode Five and Six of the Book of Boba Fett in a different location to avoid spoilers leaking out? Uh, it's amazing that there were so few significant leaks. It felt like Favreau and Filoni prioritized Five and Six over the earlier. Maybe they were more involved with them. Maybe, but Stubble, I have to say that where." Um, where the Mandalorian and where Book of Boba Fett are shot are at Manhattan Beach Studios. The security there is incredible. When you're shooting in Atlanta, you know, or shooting at Pinewood in England, no one, no one, there's, there's, it's hard to keep it all uh, locked down because there's a lot more people. Manhattan Beach Studios, if you're walking into one of those volume stages or the stagecraft stages, they don't let anyone in there unless they're supposed to be. And if they are supposed to be there, they have NWAs, NWAs, NDA, NWA is an entirely different thing. Out the wazoo. So, yeah. Uh, it doesn't surprise me that nothing gets out. I think, I, no, I think Favreau and Filoni were, were all in on this stuff. You know, they, they did. They, they're trying to make the best shows they can make, but I think they have a lot under their belts. I don't know. Jordan Wilson says, hey, John, I recently watched for the fifth time a movie called 13 Assassins. If you haven't seen it, give it a watch. It's the ultimate righteous revenge film. I have seen it. I'm sure Rob has seen it and can speak to how amazing this Japanese film really is. Thanks. 13 Assassins rules. I don't want to spoil it, but you are right. A righteous revenge film it is. I don't want to spoil it. Everybody should watch it. Just, you know what? Watch it sight unseen. It has my seal of approval and apparently Jordan Wilson's too. Just check it out. You won't be sorry you did. Spider-Man is the best, sends in a tip and says, talking about No Way Home's ending. One thing knows for sure is how long was Eddie in the MCU? From Venom 2 to No Way Home, we don't know the time difference. That's a very good point. There is a chance where Spidey could face Venom after all or team up. I don't know. I mean, I you know what? I think it's um it's a really good point. Like we don't know how long he was there. I don't know. So maybe he was there for a lot longer than we thought. But as John said, why did magic allow a little sliver, a little droplet of Venom to fall and and is that enough to make another symbiote? I don't know. But he could. I still think they need to make Venom 3 with Andrew Garfield in the Sony-verse. Because wouldn't that be dope? I mean, who wouldn't love that? Uh, Maxwell and the Apocalypse sends in a tip and says, On Friday's show, when you cut to the foreshot of all you guys talking away, meanwhile, Cad Bane is just waiting and waiting to get his opinion in. <laughs> Kept imagining him starting to speak, only to get cut off again and again. Too funny. Well, Maxwell, I'm glad you think it's funny. Uh, I like that. Um, you know, when there's only three of us, we have to put somebody up there. And why not Cad Bane? That was, by the way, Ray's idea. And I thought it was a good one. I love Cad Bane. I want to believe he's not dead. Not a fan of Cad Bane's death. Big Will 
sends in a tip and says, Hi, John and Crew. You recently said that EA is making Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order 2. My question is, would you like to see Galen Merrick Starkiller make an appearance in the game? It would be interesting to see Galen Merrick versus Cal Kestis uh, go one-on-one. Bring on the filthy. Why not? Yeah. Uh, You know what? I made a mistake once. I want to say that I want to see the return of Dash Rendar from Shadows of the Empire. But yeah, I love Jedi Fallen Order. I'm, I'm glad they're making a sequel. I hope it's better than... What is it? Power of the, uh, uh, the Force Unleashed 2. I hope it's better than that. Because I was kind of disappointed, to be honest. Um, but yeah, I think that'd be cool. Why not? Bring it on. Terry Lanza says, Hi, John. To be honest, not liking the new show, The Gilded Age, because of Downton Abbey. Yeah, I've heard that. I haven't watched it. It looks good. I kind of want to jump in. I, I you know, I want to jump in, but if it's not good... And listen, you know, we here on the John Campia Show take your opinion seriously. If you guys don't think something's good, and I... I'm like kind of stoked for the Gilded Age. I'm like, why wouldn't I, 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 you know, but if you don't think it's good. And one of the best shows in the last 10 years, in my opinion, is Broadchurch with Doctor Who. I love Broadchurch. It's so good. If you haven't seen it, it's set in a town on the coast of, uh, of the UK that you need to go just see it. It's great. But yeah, I think it's great. Why do you think it's difficult for those shows here in the U.S. to be like the U.K. shows and not Americanize it? Wait, hang on a second. Why do you think it's difficult for those here in the U.S. to like the U.K. shows and not Americanize it? You know, I it, just because I think it's a different culture, <laughs> I mean, I I like the differences. Like when I'm watching a broad church, which is from the U.K., or a money heist, which is from Spain, I like the cultural differences. That's one of the reasons I find the shows attractive to watch because I'm like, I'm learning about how things are done differently, like police procedure. I think that's kind of cool. You know, I'm like, okay. All right, that's different. That's un- that's new and unusual. I hadn't thought about that, but yeah. Uh, but I do want to watch The Gilded Age. You didn't say uh, one of the reasons that you're, you're not liking The Gilded Age. I mean, a lot of people said they don't like it as much. I'm like, but why? What is it about The Gilded Age? But, um, but Terry, thanks for writing in. I appreciate that. A baked orc. <laughs> I smell orc flesh. A baked orc says, hey, John and crew, I hope you're all having a very baked and orcish day. <laughs> I can only imagine, you know, an orc with a spliff just be like, I, uh, I smell uh, man flesh. Yeah, I don't know. I've been a big fan of all of James Gunn's comic book movies. And now Peacemaker as well. If it were to happen... What do you think James Gunn's skill set as a director and or writer could bring to the MCU's first Deadpool movie? Ooh. That's a great idea. That's a great idea. I, I think that James Gunn would be very good at doing a Deadpool film. Uh, the work you do makes, <laughs> makes many orcs in my tribe very happy. Thanks for a ton. Thanks a ton for all, all what you guys do. Um, First of all, Baked Orc, thanks for saying so. That's very nice of you. But I, I think you're onto something there. The only thing, the only thing that I would worry about is, I mean, obviously Deadpool does a lot of fourth wall breaking, not as much as Peacemaker. I mean, uh, way more than Peacemaker does. But I could see of all the writer directors, it would be really interesting because, of course, Tim Miller, who directed Deadpool one, didn't write it. So I would love to see what James Gunn, who is an auteur, meaning he is a writer director. What would he bring? What would he bring? I that would be bonkers. I would baked orc. Uh, the work you do makes us in our tribe very happy too. That's a great question. Really good question. Luke one two three four sends in a tip and says, "I believe during the height of the pandemic, you were going through YouTube burnout. You also took two to three weeks off to catch up on backed up questions with your guests now in the studio and the energy they bring. Does that help prevent burnout 2.0? Luke, I, you know what? I can answer that for myself. Um, I can't answer for John, obviously. But yeah, I mean, during the pandemic, I really, I was grinding on my own YouTube channel. And I was doing five shows a week, even more so. I was doing all kinds of stuff. And you do get burnt out only because, um, you know, you want to find, you want to find stuff that's engaging to talk about for the audience as well as yourself. And if we're not engaged, like imagine if I was like this, if I'm like, yeah, Luke. Uh, hey, uh, thanks for writing in, man. I uh, 
you know, I'm depressed. I haven't gone inside my house. I was reading news about James Gunn making a Peacemaker series. I, mean, I don't know. It might be cool. Who knows? If that was the show, would anyone watch? So we're very aware. Like John, I mean, look, like I've said before, look at, I look at this and I'm like, look at how good I look. I mean, not, I mean, good in terms of the image, not necessarily me. Hey there, how are you? Uh, but no, I'm talking about the actual look of the show, the lighting. John does such a great show making the show look great. But looking great isn't enough. You've got to be engaging. You have to be like, hey there, how's it going? In a world where the John Campia show was suffering from burnout, who would watch? You know, John's big deal, and he, I, I've learned uh, from him. John has said, look, he said, Rob, he said to you guys, he said that the audience experience is of primary importance to him. Like, I look around, like, John has on me a very expensive camera and a very expensive lens, the way he's got lights in the background, and look at how crisp and clear I look. You can see every nuance and crickle in my forehead. I look old like I'm going to die soon. But still, it looks fantastic. I might be dying, but hey, at least I'll look good and be lit well. But no, getting, you know, having burnout, it's it's rough because, you know, you get letters from people like Rob or John gets letters. I mean, and you've heard him today already. Um, you know, your show means a lot to me. I've had a really hard time. And when you read that, you're like, I don't want to let anyone down, man. But it does. Burnout's a problem because sometimes you're just like, oh, what am I going to say, man? I don't know. People expect me to be like, hi there. Welcome to the John Campia show. you got to be on it. And if you're not on it, being... Burning out is a big thing, especially on YouTube. I'm not the only YouTuber who's talked about that. There's a lot of YouTubers who have done interviews and talk about burnout. Because, we look, we love you guys. We love the audience. And can you imagine if we were just like, hey, welcome to the show. It's fine. We're here for another day. I mean, what do you want me to say? Marvel movies, Star Wars, Star Trek, Doctor Who, woo. Would you watch that show? Some people might. But come on, most of us wouldn't. That's no fun to do. But Luke, I think for me, I have to say being in the studio now with everyone has been a blessing. It has been a breath of fresh air, a hot poker in my ass, so to speak. It's been so much, well, maybe not that. It's been so much fun to be in the studio with Ray and with with Kimberly and with Aaron and and uh, with Chris and John. I mean, we, we're having a blast, probably too much fun. I sometimes feel guilty like I'm thinking, oh, I got to go into work and do the show today. But I'm like, is this work? Is it? I mean, really? But Luke, uh, it's great. And and I think the energy does prevent burnout. We all went to lunch today. I mean, we go out after lunch. I mean, I'm telling you, I've, I don't think I've ever worked or, or liked coworkers. I've never worked with people. I've never worked with coworkers I've liked as much. Uh, so it's been great. It's been great. Your friend, Adam. You wish, Adam. What do you mean your friend? I'm your friend. Uh, you're not my friend. No, you are my friend. You're all my friends. But that's very presumptuous, your friend, Adam. Uh, hi, John. I've been watching since AMC. And I love all the work you guys put in to bring us the best content possible. Well, I thank you for that, your friend, Adam. You know what? You are my friend. You say it. I agree with it. So thank you. Uh, now my question. Am I crazy to think that Dev Patel could be a great 007? Either I've missed his name being suggested or it just hasn't. Thanks. I like that idea. You know, I, I don't have a problem. You know, James Bond was a literary character that came out. It was born in the Cold War of the 1950s. Um, but but be, because we have a 60-year, this is the 60th anniversary of the release of Dr. No in 1962. Um, because we have a 60-year legacy of Bond, I have no problem with him being played by uh, someone who is not a white Brit. I want him to be, Bond has to be a Brit. I don't care really what color he is, but I think that because we have such a rich legacy, if you're going to swap uh, any kind of, I mean, Dev Patel uh, comes from East India, he's an East India background, or Idris Elba, who comes from an African background, I don't have a problem with that, you know, but it would be jarring, I, and I think it would be really interesting. Like, if Idris Elba was James Bond or Dev Patel was James Bond, it would be sort of interesting, like, what would their different eth ethnicity, how would that help or hinder their mission? I think it could be really interesting. It would just add another layer of characterization. 
I think it could be good. I, it's funny. I haven't heard that, but I really love Dev Patel. I think he's a really good actor, and I think that's a really good call. So your friend, Adam, you've you become my friend for your good question and, well, for, let's face it, your complimentary attitude toward us. So thank you for that. Alejandro says, hey, John, love the show. Longtime viewer, but first time tipper. Well, Alejandro, thank you for tipping. Thanks for the support. As a longtime reader and lover of the Batman character and source material, the Batman is in the is the physical representation of what my brain views as definitive early Batman. Literally can't wait. Well, Alejandro, I agree with you. I think that what Alejandro is saying is that the Batman, Matt Reeves, the Batman that we're all seeing on March 1st. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm not a song and dance man, clearly. But uh, I want to thank you for that. But, yeah, so we're seeing the Batman. I, I get what you're saying. It looks more along the lines of we just celebrated Bill Finger's birthday, his 108th birthday. Um, I do think that there is a real world quality to this new iteration of Batman. I mean, to be fair, I hope you will allow me to 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 hold off on my initial assessment until I've actually seen the movie. But um, it looks pretty great, and like you said. In my mind, I think you're right. This 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 version of Batman, it could very well be the definitive version of Batman. I mean, I could see that happening. Definitely could see it happening. Because it's just, you know, me, I'm always banging on about peak verisimilitude, which is the quality of being real. It looks it looks pretty incredible. And and uh I, I'm in, man. I am in. Pepper Jack, 2001. You mentioned Star Wars getting a stale. You mentioned Star Wars getting stale or shrinking. Asking, when will they do something new? But wouldn't you agree that DC is even more guilty of this? I'm 40 and I've seen six Batman's in my lifetime. Yes, I I would say that. But you know, I think the problem with Batman is Batman is Batman. So if you're gonna do uh, if you're gonna do Batman movies, people know what they're getting. It's just like James Bond. You know, there's been 25 official Bond films. There's been unofficial John, James Bond movies like Casino Royale, not the Daniel Craig Casino Royale, but the one from 1967. And then there's, of course, 1983's Never Say Never Again, which is a remake of 65's Thunderball. So um, uh, I, I think that Star Wars has a whole universe, whereas Batman is always Batman, Gotham City, whatever. So Batman's, I think, a very popular, obviously, character, and I just... When it comes to Star Wars, I want to see you've got a whole galaxy. So why has Tatooine become like the center point? I know it's easy to have those desert environments, but <coughs> I, you know, I just want more. I, I demand more of my Star Wars. Uh, Anonymous sends in a twenty dollars tip. Well, thank you, Anonymous. I appreciate that, uh, and so does everyone here. Hey, John, on Mailbag Three, uh, I said I brought, I bought my first hot toy. Rob said, which one? Captain America, Endgame, baby. That comes with Mjolnir and the Shattered Shield. Dude, dude, dude. Can we talk about how great that figure is? I mean, I had to wait. So so I ordered uh, the Endgame Captain America, and I wanted that because I didn't buy that. It's, it's That Endgame Captain America has kind of the same armor he's had for a couple of movies now, but I didn't get that first hot toy. And I wanted it. Oh, I wanted it, Ringo. Uh, and I finally got it. And it was supposed to come out in February. I think I got mine in like August. It is so good. So I would hope. Uh, also, he, by the way, Anonymous was like, yes, uh, Rob, we get it. No, but it's a great Hot Toys figure. I hope you love it. Um, it's your first Hot Toy, and I hope it lived up to your expectations. And once you have that, I mean, talk about shelf presence, man. You get that. You can swap out the jaw the mouth so good uh but anonymous says also bought a no oh wait hang on <laughs> i'm too excited I'm, I'm i'm in my hot toys revelry so hold on a minute <laughs> let me go on anonymous he says also i'm glad to hear you guys are willing to do upcoming monthly movie anticipations well i also bought another hot toy spider-man infinity war is that the iron spider suit because that that hot toy is Dope AF. I love that with the 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 uh the ratcheted joint arms and stuff. 
oh, it's so good. That figure is so good. So you've got two – that those two figures on a shelf properly displayed, that's some shelf presence, son. Uh, send us a picture or send it to me on Instagram, Burnett RM. Uh, or uh, actually on Instagram, I'm, I'm Robert Meyer Burnett or RMB, I forget. Send me that or send it to me, DM it to me on uh, Twitter at Burnett RM. I'd love to see it. AM says, your intro music is great. Reminds me of the days of playing Quake 2. You know, I've always wondered. I like John's uh, intro. Dun, 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 whatever that is. I love it. I think it's great. Um, don't know what it is, but Quake 2, blast from the past. I used to love playing Quake. Uh, I haven't played it in a long time. But you're not wrong. You're not wrong. Flapjacks sends in a tip and says, hello, John and team. Well, hello. I've been watching your show for I don't know how many years, but this is my first time sending in a tip. Well, Flapjacks, I hope it was good for you. Uh, first time sending in a tip. About the nudity in Pam and Tommy Lee, or Pam, Pam and Tommy. Uh it should be noted that they used a body double for Lily and a prosthetic penis for Sebastian. Well, I would hope so because a talk, I've never seen a talking penis before uh, in movies. I mean, I've never, you know, I don't look at other dudes' junk. But, hey, I was a little scared, so to know it's fake, I feel better. It's like Mark Wahlberg unfurling in Boogie Nights. Glad that was fake, too, because I would feel very inadequate. I didn't know that, but, oh, so now I... Uh, well, Lily James, I guess I can't, you know, she's still beautiful. Uh, Adam Smith, one of two, says, this is for Rob. Adam, oh, I'm here. The role of guest host is occasionally underappreciated. You need to be interesting without upstaging, contribute without talking too much, have your own opinions without being disagreeable. You kill it, man. Thank you, Adam Smith. What can I say? Maybe I should cut this out and send this to John whenever he gets mad at me. No, he doesn't usually get mad at me, but that's very sweet of you. Thank you for saying. John, your awesomeness goes without saying. Well, there you go. See, that was good. You got us You got us both. That was very nice. Adam, I appreciate that. You know, here's the thing. A lot of people have said to me, they're like, you know, Rob, sometimes, you know, John doesn't let you talk. And I'm like, yo, it's called The John Campia Show for a reason. I've got my own show, Rob Observations. I can talk all I want. In fact, I talk a lot on that show because I don't have a co-host and I can just just babble on. Um, but this is John's show. And and to me, John sets the tone. He's been doing this for a long time. He's at the top of his game. I am honored to be here. And the fact that John has picked me. There's a movie called Mommy Dearest that's about Joan Crawford. And it look, to me, it's it's more of a, guilty pleasure than anything else. I really love it. But there's Joan Crawford adopts Christina Craw Crawford, her daughter, her adoptive daughter. And, and, and uh, <laughs> I'm adopted myself. So <laughs> I always joke because in the movie, well, tell me what you think of adopted children. Adopted children are better because they're chosen. <laughs> well, I kind of feel that way about John. He's chosen me. I'm here at his, he, he picked me. He picked me. Pretty cool. I'm very happy to be here, and I'm glad you like the show. And and uh, John John's awesomeness goes without saying. So thank you for that, Adam Smith. K-Rock says, one or two. I saw a question about 50 cents power the other day. Can we just stop and applaud 50, 50 real fast or 50? 50 real fast power and its spinoffs along with his BMF series are the biggest things to ever come to stars. But he also had For Life on ABC all of which are actually very good shows. Along with his acting career with a role in the upcoming Expendables 4 and Den of Thieves 2. By the way, I love the first Den of Thieves. So He also has another spinoff of his Power Universe coming out. And I also recommend giving Power a chance. The first episode hooks you. I agree. K-Rock, K-Rock. Uh, I think you're right. I mean, first of all, 50 Cent, and when I say 50 Cent, I, I sound painfully white. But if I say fitty, like, I don't know him, but in my mind, it's, do you like 50 Cent? I mean, like, I couldn't be more white. But I have to tell you, tell you, I'm a huge fan of 50 Cent. I think that he's a tremendous talent. He's a great rapper, but he's also become a great producer. And I, I agree with you. His his programming quality. Of, I, I started watching Power because my friend Adam Huss played a cop on the first couple of, uh, first couple of seasons. And I really liked it. And I, I'm I'm all mad props to uh, 50. 
50. I say 50. It's like, uh, would you like to come to my bank and open an account? I mean, my God. I mean, I'm white, but I don't want to be painfully white. Um, so I'll just say 50, like I know him, you know. But I think you're right. I think power is a good show, and the, the power universe is very cool. And I think he's got great taste. I think that's why the shows work. James L.H. says, John, hope you don't mind an NFL query, if I can answer it. I'm a casual UK viewer of the NFL. I enjoy it. As a sports fan, I understand rivalry. So what's the story behind the fun of seeing the Cowboys and the 49ers losing? <sighs> are there other teams in the NFL and the NHL that are rivals? Well, first of all, yes. I mean, I'm from Seattle, so we hate the Cowboys and the 49ers. Now, here's the thing. When I say we hate them, you know, well, the San Francisco 49ers are pretty much the closest NFL team to us. If you're in Seattle, you go through Oregon, you get to Northern California, you get to the 49ers. So we're kind of like, like you know, UCLA and USC. We're like big colleges in the same town across the uh, across the road from each other, basically actually about 20 minutes away from each other, but still. So we're in the same town, you know, we're big schools, everyone rivalry. So I think it's look, it's part of it's part of 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 watching uh teams that play each other often and they've got a record of going back and forth, a legacy of hatred. I mean, I don't know. I don't know about the NHL. I don't know to be honest, I don't know sh FL about uh, or F all about the NHL. I really don't, really don't. But I would say that um you know, in the NFL, there are long time, like when you, if you've grown up in a city and you continue to live there and they're your hometown, uh, your hometown team, or, or in, in, in Ray's case, he loves the Cincinnati Bengals. And he tells the story of why he loves the Bengals. And he never lived in Cincinnati, but the reason he loves the Bengals is a pretty fun reason. I'll leave him to tell you that in the future. But I think that, that when you have those teams, they end up, having rivalries with other teams because they play them and things happen. Someone loses when they shouldn't have. So these rivalries develop. I think it makes being a sports fan more fun. I mean, all of it's kind of silly if you think about it, but it's also amusing. Uh, James LH goes on to say, <laughs> so I went to see Moonfall. You're a better man than some of us, but we all love it. So I went to see Moonfall. I don't know if you watched. I don't know if you watched on YouTube UK. Critic Mark Kermode, his review of Moonfall is entertaining. Here are some of his quotes that sum up my feelings. Radioactively dumb. The level of stupid is so brilliant that it's magnificent. <laughs> it's the stupidest film I've seen in my whole life, and I'm grinning ear to ear. The moon is made of cheese. My friend really enjoyed it. This is how different we are. Unlike me, he's not keen on Batman because of Pattinson. Look, first of all, James, I love Mark Kermode. He's one of my favorite critics. I watch all of his videos, the BBC videos on YouTube. I'm a huge fan of his. I hope one day I can meet him. Really love him. But I, I think he's, I mean, <laughs> if Mark Kermode is saying this is awesome, radioactively dumb, <laughs> But fun. The level of stupid is so brilliant that it's magnificent. Well, that pretty much sums it right up. It's the stupidest film I've seen in my whole life, and I'm grinning ear to ear. He's not wrong. That Mark Kermode, see, he gets it. You know, you could just write it off and be like, oh, Moonfall just sucks. It's so terrible. Well, yeah. <laughs> but that's easy to point out. But the fact that he would say it's the stupidest film I've seen in my whole life, and I'm grinning ear to ear, that's, <laughs> he's right. <laughs> Totally. Love it. Love it. Uh, James LH goes on to say, another for me. A couple of years ago, BAFTA added best casting. Some others also have done this. Do you think the Oscars should? Sometimes you see some of the amazing ensembles. I recently rewatched Tinker Taylor on 4K, Tinker Taylor's Soldier Spy. Amazing cast, films like Spotlight and The Big Short. Dude, I love The Big Short and I love Spotlight. But you're right. But here's my problem. Here's my problem about giving awards to best ensemble. A lot of the time, you have to hire the actor that you can get that will get the movie made. Not based on, it's based more on their box office. Maybe they're right for the role. You hope they're right for the role. Sometimes they're not. But, 
you know, there's a number of factors that create a great cast. And I do like the idea because here's the thing. It doesn't necessarily mean they're going to gel. But when the director, the casting director, the producers, they put together a cast and that cast gels under hopefully the direction of a, of a great director, you get something really special. And I think the movies that you cite, the big short, there's not a bad performance. I love the big short. Every, to me, the big short does, it doesn't matter how big the role is or how small the role is. Every single actor in that movie is great. They hit those right notes. That's the way you want to go. Awesome. But you're right. I mean, should we add that category to the Oscars? I think it makes sense in the SAG Awards. I don't necessarily know if, if if it's the kind of award that's fair for the Oscars because I think there's too many factors involved and it's not necessarily the work of one person, even though a great casting director is key. Um, so yeah, I mean, but it's that's a good one. I don't know if the Oscars should though. James LH goes on. First of all, James, let me just say thank you uh, for supporting the channel in this way. Very much appreciate that. So thank you very much. James LH says, final one for me. Speaking of Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, I was reading rumors recently of Gary Oldman playing George Smiley again. I know it's rumors, but I would love to see it. But it depends on, as you guys always say, who's involved, story, and of course, finance. Well, you know, Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy led to Smiley's people with Alec Guinness. I would, I loved it. I would love to see a Smiley's people with Gary Oldman. Bring it on, man. I love Gary Oldman. And I, yeah, it depends. I mean, who they're going to get to do it and how that's going to work. And I mean, but count me in. I'm in. Sempigar says, I keep hearing about how everyone wants Garfield to play Spider-Man. I just don't get it. I mean, we already had a pig as Spider-Man in the Spider-Verse. Uh, why do we need a fat cat that eats lasagna as Spider-Man 2? Talk about multiverse, just kidding. Send Pygar. No, I mean, I think, look, Andrew Garfield's great. He's a great actor, and he I think he was the real heart and soul of uh, No Way Home, so why not? Come on now. He'd be good. Uh, Andrew Garfield fights Venom in Venom 3. That's what I'm saying. Hi, John and Rob. I love the new mailbag segment. Well, welcome to another episode of Mailbag. I guess you like it, so that's good. I also loved Belfast and was very impressed with Jamie Dornan. I'm not sure if his name has been mentioned on any lists for the new Bond, but I think he'd be terrific. He's also the perfect age to do several. Ooh, Hitchcock. Hitchcock. Oh, pardon me. I didn't even say. That's from Hitchcock is the goat. Hitchcock is the goat. That's not a bad idea. I like that idea. I like that idea. I think that's, uh, I think that's good. Hitchcock is the goat. Sends in another tip and says, I just finished episode five of Boba Fett. And after just recently catching up on Deadwood and also finishing Justified three months ago, I realized that any script requiring a marshal or sheriff going forward needs to be cast by Timothy Oliphant. He's just awesome. He is. He's so good in that role. By the way, if you are a Timothy Oliphant fan, um, Doug Lyman, who made um, the first Jason Bourne movie, his second feature after Swingers was a movie called Go that I can't recommend highly enough that Timothy Oliphant is in. So, yeah, I agree. <laughs> Any Marshall, give him the job. Give him the job. Absolutely. Dangerous D says, Hi, John. Valentine's Day is coming up. What is your top five romantic movies? Mine is, in particular order, Crazy Rich Asians, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, When Harry Met Sally, Stranger Than Fiction, and Princess Bride. Do you agree? What's your favorite? Oh, my favorite romantic movies. Well, Wong Kar Wai's In the Mood for Love has got to be up there. Uh, I think uh, The English Patient, The Way We Were, um, <laughs> Love Story, Love Means Never Having to Say You're Sorry. These are a little older. And, of course, When Harry Met Sally is one of my favorite movies of all time. But I also think perhaps my favorite romantic movie of all time, and it's not just it ends on a romantic note, but it's about the romanticism of life, of everyday life, Amelie. Jean-Pierre Genet's Amelie. It's one of my favorite films of all time. Star Wars Lady says, Hey all, it's not a good outlook for the future of cinema if they start reusing only CGI people. That sets us way, way back. Also, CGI will never be able to capture the talent of raw human emotion. And that's 
what moves me. Just recast Luke. I can't believe people would rather have a fake Luke than just recasting the role that allows us new fresh faces to be able to come in and play the part, someone who has Luke's essence and also looks like Mark Hamill as well, but mainly embodies Luke. Star Wars Lady, you have brought up a really interesting ethical, moral, and artistic dilemma. Do we want to watch computerized recreations of human beings? Even Luke's voice in Mandalorian, or pardon me, in Book of Boba Fett was synthesized, you know? And I guess it's the equivalent of maybe watching animation or something, but even animated characters have real human emotions by them. And I think you're right. Are we as a people, as a race, as one race, we're one race, the human race, are we going to... Knowing you're watching a a completely computer-generated character, you still got writing and directing and all the things that go into that, but I think part of the reason we love movies so much or television shows is we know it's real people portraying them. And if they're not, if we're just watching computerized recreations of humans, is that something that we care about? I would say no. I hope I'm wrong. I mean, I hope I'm right about this. I hope people reject the notion Knowing that the Luke in Book of Boba Fett was completely computer generated, I mean, there's a human being with who's had a face deep faked on it, but you're even listening to a synthesized voice. I am with you, to be honest, Star Wars lady. I think that's a very astute and it's a very important question to ask. And the real question is, are people going to put up with it? I think human beings, we watch those things. Oh, Star Wars lady goes on to say, this tech is not good. Eventually, we don't need actors, but the thing that made performances special was real acting, not this CGI deep fake stuff. This is very bad for the future of cinema, in my opinion. Luke and real people turning into Mickey Mouse, horrifying. I do not disagree. I think you're absolutely right. I think that if the human element is completely eliminated from movies and television, I'll go play video games. I don't need to... to I don't want to watch movies and television that aren't, that's part of the art form. I don't want to watch CG. I don't. Plus, you're not getting, you're not getting the twinkle that's in Mark Hamill's performance. It's really hard to do that. You're getting a me mechanical facsimile and it's not cool. Jonathan sends in a tip and says, hey guys, do you like the last Airbender animated series? It's great. And what is your opinion about the show? Do you have hope for their Netflix real life adaptation? Well, first of all, The Last Airbender, the characters, the mythology, the story, epic, so good, so engrossing. Um, is it going to be as good live action? I don't know, man. Because there's something, there's something inherent to animation and anime when you translate it. it, it, it there's a certain whimsy a certain joy. It's just a different quality than it is in something that's real. And do we want that? I don't know. Um, look, we already saw what one bad last airbender movie can look like. It's not easy to do. Not easy to do. I hope it's good. Like I want it to be good. Will it be good? I hope so. Cause I don't like to see things that are bad. Dangerous D says, hey, John, in my last message, I asked your top five romantic movies in honor of Valentine's Day. I gave my list, but I didn't think I put my fifth choice. It's Indecent Proposal, directed by Adrian Lyne. It's an underrated movie starring Robert Redford, Woody Harrelson, and Demi Moore. Thoughts? Okay, for those of you who have not seen Indecent Proposal, you got to see it because basically Robert Redford, this handsome older millionaire, offers Woody Harrelson a million dollars to sleep with his wife, to spend the night with his wife, uh, Demi Moore. And then, of course, shenanigans, hijinks ensue. I don't know if it's, I guess ultimately it ends on a romantic note, but it's rough, man. I don't know. Would you give up your significant other? Boys, girls, gentle beings, however you identify, if your significant other was offered a million bucks by a very handsome or beautiful stranger, would you allow your significant other to, to would you allow them to sleep with somebody else for a million bucks for one night? Or would it drive you insane? I don't know if I could do it. I don't know if I'm that evolved. I'd be too jealous. Too jealous. But an interesting film for Valentine's Day. <laughs> well, honey, a uh, mysterious stranger has offered us a million dollars. You just have to go spend the night with him. And the thing is, if your wife's like, great, 
Or she said, really, a million dollars? Either way, you lose. <laughs> That's a tough one. A lot of, you know what? It's interesting that you talk about that, though. Not enough people talk about that. And, of course, Ben Affleck and uh, Anna Diarmas did a, a new movie I think it's called like Shallow Water. It's not, although that's not the right name. It's it's they've done a, a, a erotic thriller that was pulled from the January release schedule that I really want to see. I'm a huge Adrian Line fan. Uh, Orange Hand sends in a tip and says, "I think this is the second Super Bowl in a row to have one of the teams playing at their home field. To make sure this never happens again, perhaps they should move all future Super Bowls to the AT and T Stadium in Dallas. <laughs> uh, one day the Cowboys will come back." The Cowboys are America's team, after all, right? Uh, anyway, Steele sends in a tip and says, Hey, John, have you had the chance to watch Reacher yet on Prime? I, of course, did. I would definitely recommend watching it. Richson Reacher is great, 10 times better than Cruz. Prime is killing it with Tom Clancy material lately. Thanks, and please do an Uncharted spoiler video. We might do that. I love Reacher. I love the books. I've read a lot of them. I don't think I've read all of them. I've read a lot of them. I love Lee Child's Reacher books. They're really good. Uh, I thought the show was really, really good. Yeah, sure, there's a lot of television conventions in it, but a lot of people die. The The actors were great. I had so much fun watching it. It's it's good. I loved it. And I thought, uh, it, it's. I keep saying Richard Sin, but it's Richson. He killed it. I mean, my God, how much do you have to work out to look that way? And can I... Can I figure out a way to look that way? I'd love to look that way. I can do it. You put in the time, you can do it. I could look just like him. Uh, Jer Jarek says, hey, crew, recently heard that a previous screening of the Batman will take place at Le Grand Rex in France on March 1st, the biggest cinema in Europe. That just shows that Warner Brothers must be confident that this might be an awards contender film like The Dark Knight. Dude, I would love to go to Le Grand Rex in, in France. Where is that? Is that in Paris? Is that in Nice? Is that in Cannes? Where is... Is that somewhere else? Uh, I'd love to go. I love France, man. France, to me, is the ultimate cinema country. When I first went to Paris, I, I, first of all, I never wanted to go to sleep because it was so beautiful I couldn't handle it. I was, and, and, But you'd, you'd be in these like neighborhoods where you, the last place in the world you'd think you'd find a beautiful cinema playing like Casablanca, but lo and behold, it was there. Loved it. I'd love to go back. I miss Paris. Uh, and I want to go see the, twin, the, the two windmills from Amelie. The Adrenaline Knight sends in a tip and says, hey, John and company, I was wondering how movie rights work for network TV like TNT, USA, and a channel like that when it comes to movies like Star Wars. Do they have a short contract for when they want to show it? They don't own it like Disney. Well, The Adrenaline Knight, that's actually a really good question. Yes, it, it, it was a when movies would air on TV and when they do air on TV, they have to have what's called a licensing agreement. So, and usually it won't just be one movie. I guess with a movie like Star Wars, when it would air on TV back in the early 80s, it was a big deal. So it'd be usually a one-off. But sometimes, like now, they might make a licensing agreement to show like blocks of 25 movies, just like 25 MGM movies. You pay a certain amount of money. You have the right to air these movies uh, in a certain amount of <coughs> time over a certain amount of, uh, uh, you can air them for this long during these three months or something. So it's a licensing fee that you have to pay for. So that's that's how it's done. And Disney, if they want to, if they want to license out a movie, even though it's on Disney Plus, they can. But usually, what they're what the streamers are trying to do is to get everybody to come to Disney Plus. So there's going to be less and less licensing agreements with other networks like TNT. So James sends in a tip and says, "Hey, mate, my friends and I were recently talking about our most anticipated upcoming movies." When I said I'm more excited for the Batman than I was for No Way Home, they all looked offended. I couldn't let it go. The Batman just looks so fresh and good. Well, I would say this. I mean, look, for me, I knew I was going to like No Way Home. But, you know, it's yet another Spider-Man movie. And while I was wildly entertained and really enjoyed it, I think there's going to be more to intellectually chew on with the Batman, if that makes any sense. Um, so it doesn't surprise me that you would say that the Batman is you're more you're waiting for that more than Spider-Man because I do think I like No Way Home a lot I thought it was so much fun it's a great time at the movies but I think from a from a sensory and intellectual standpoint I think the Batman is going to be a more satisfying experience and by the way I'm talking out of my ass until I actually see the movie so uh, I do think that we'll have to wait and see 
I do believe it's going to be that good. So, hoping. Uh, Thor, <laughs> Thor Right Eyes sends in a tip and says, Daily appreciation to the old man who stood up to Loki in the first Avenger movie. Well, there you go. I wish that was me. I am old. I'm a man, but I did not stand up to Loki. But I agree. I love that. I love that moment. I love that moment at night, you know, and all he's making all those people kneel. It's great. That's a great moment, Thor Right Eye. Good for you. Dangerous D says, hi, John. Fun question. Well, I'll be the judge of whether it's a fun question or not. Fun question. Which TV show you want to see get their opening titles a Peacemaker treatment? <laughs> that Okay. That is a fun question. Uh, I pick Book of Boba Fett. Imagine, <laughs> imagine Boba dancing expressionless, which is on brand. Sliding door opens and Fennec, Mando, and Grogu start dancing. What do you think? It's pretty good. I'd watch that. You know, why not? <laughs> that's no, that's that's pretty damn funny. I like that idea. Uh, Raid X sends in a tip and says. Hey, John and crew, I've been a fan since the AMC Movie Talk days. I'd like to know, what is your guys' favorite opening scene or sequence to a movie? Mine is from X-Men 2. Thanks. Well, Raiden X, I, of course, as you might know, I produced all the special features for the X-Men 2 DVD or the X2 DVD or Blu-ray. And the opening sequence is, of course, Nightcrawler's attack on the White House. Dude, that scene rules. It's so good. It's a great introduction to Nightcrawler for the first time in the X-Men movie franchise. It's a great, great, great scene. So good. And it was so well done. Totally agree with you. I don't know if it's, it's my favorite opening scene from a movie, but that's that's one of them. And I would say one of my one of my favorites is the opening of Raiders. I mean, it's a very long scene when he invades the temple and gets the idol and he loses it to Belloc. Yes, perhaps you could wound them. If only you spoke of Vitos. I love that. So good. Uh, Chris Kaz send, says, last night my wife and I watched Good Time on Netflix and absolutely loved it. It's so good. Pattinson's so good. He is not Twilight Boy. See, I can't do it as well as John, but uh, it's so good. So after that, what are some recommendations for some of the other cast members of the Batman for some of us who don't know their body of work, i.e. Paul Dano and Zoe Kravitz? Well, you got to watch. You got to watch. There will be blood. Zoe Kravitz. I mean, you know, I really liked her in the remake of High Fidelity, the TV series. And what's interesting is her mom, you know, was in uh, the original High Fidelity. So check that out. Um, good question. Anonymous, one of three. Anonymous sends in a tip and says, hey, John, as we all have, I've definitely been through my fair share of shit, especially in the last two years. But did you go through the same amount of shit that Andy Dufresne had to crawl through in Shawshank Redemption? Because that was a lot of shit. You may not really think your words have much impact, but as a listener of your show, I've heard you repeatedly say, don't wait until tomorrow. While I do think I'm talented, laugh out loud, I'm a naturally very lazy and stubborn person who has been prone to self-pity. All of this kept me immobilized for years, and while there were reasons behind it, it was ultimately my own doing. 2020 made me realize I need to act on my dreams. In the last eight months, I started stand-up, building a video advertisement business, writing a book, and going back to my TV pilot. I just want to say thanks for adding a little extra fuel to my engine. Anonymous, I got to say, letters like yours are some of my favorite letters that I hear on YouTube whenever, not just for the John Campy show, but for my own show as well. Um, you know... Don't wait until tomorrow. Like when you say, while I do think I'm talented, I am naturally very lazy and stubborn who has been prone to self-pity. Here's the thing. You could be the most talented person in the world. And who knows? Anyone listening to me right now might, might very well be that. But that's not enough. You know, what you have to do, like you say, it kept me immobilized for years and there were reasons behind it. It was ultimately my own doing. Um, it made me realize I need to act on my dreams. This is the this is the thing that everybody in the world needs. So it's the most important lesson. Nothing is ever going to find you. you. Manna from heaven is not going to fall out of the sky. You're not going to win the lottery. Only you can prevent forest fires. Only you can make sure that your life changes. And it sounds like Anonymous, you did just that. 
you know what? There's time. You want to wallow in self pity? Wallow in self pity after you've achieved your dreams. Because achieving your dreams is a never ending, hard, daily grind. But you know what? Look what you said. I mean, you started stand up, building video advertisement business, writing a book, and going back to your TV pilot. Bruh. I mean, you're anonymous. You could be cis uh, or they, whoever, however you identify. It's important. It's important to make your dreams happen. Because what else are you going to do? Think about it. You could hang out on the couch and play some more Ghost of Tsushima. It's fine. I get it. Or you can go out there and achieve your dreams. The thing is, no one's going to do it for you. You're the only one. So Anonymous, I love hearing you say that. Congratulations. Keep us posted. Uh, if we can see your stand-up or get your book on Amazon or whatever, um, send us links. We'll make people buy them. And say, look, look what Anonymous did, 2020. Love hearing that. Flash boy says, the theatrical versus director's cut debate fascinates me because I find myself going back and forth. However, one argument that compels me to John's side is that of the awards. When a film wins the Oscar for best editing, it means that the film, as it is cut, is recognized as excellent. If one changes the editing of a film, are you not fundamentally changing the work? When Lucas submitted the 97 cut of Star Wars to the National Film Registry, they rejected it because it was not the cut of Star Wars that broke new ground for cinema. The award-winning FX, sound design, and editing were altered and therefore cannot be recognized historically as Star Wars, and they would be correct. Likewise, the extended cuts of Lord of the Ring are beloved, but this just doesn't change the fact that you are not watching the historically recognized award-winning version of the series. If official movies are the text, then any subsequent version is paratext, even if written and or edited by the author. Thank you for indulging me. I hope to spark a flame war. Well, Flashboy, as an editor myself, I have a lot of thoughts. See, here's the thing. A lot of times, you know, when you're making a movie, you might have edited the film already, but it's too long. So you go in, you can excise scenes. Those scenes were cut. They were originally in the film. So I think that an argument can be made and say, like, the extended version of Lord of the Rings were not necessarily created after the fact. The versions that were theatrically re were, that were released were mandated by the studio to be a certain length. But the actual definitive versions that Peter Jackson wanted to make, I think, are the extended versions. Now, you could say from a, a rule standpoint... Um, I mean, it's a compelling argument for or against. I would tend to go with the director's definitive, what he believes is his the best version of the movie. In the case of Star Wars, George Lucas went back and altered Star Wars 20 years later. He didn't have director's cuts ready to go. He had He cut the movie, and I would dare say that the people that worked on the special editions of Star Wars were not the people that worked on the original movie. And if they were, maybe you could make an argument, but they weren't. 20 years later is a different kettle of fish. Two decades, you're, you're, what you're doing is you've ch you fundamentally changed a film. You've added, Job of the Hutt didn't appear in Star Wars. You've added a character that never appeared in the original version of the movie. And when he did appear, it was a human being. So it's a different version entirely. However, if when you were making Lord of the Rings, if you had the extended version and that was your definitive version, you realize, okay, we have to cut it for time, so we're excising scenes. It's tough, and I don't think all director's cuts are the same. Um, they're different, but it's a really compelling question, and I like how you put it. Um, very, very interesting. Um, very interesting. I don't know the answers. Now, see, now I'm going to be thinking about this for the rest of the day. Look what you've done. Some dude sends in a tip and says, let's say that Force Ghost Obi-Wan appears in The Mandalorian or Boba Fett. Is it Ewan McGregor or do they CGI Alec Guinness like they did young Luke? Um, I think you got to go with Ewan McGregor. He's still alive. He played Obi-Wan arguably longer than Alec Guinness did at, as a younger man. So, um, uh, you know, I would go, I would go with, uh, I would go with uh, Ewan McGregor. I really would. Jared Goff Midian, I see what you did there. Jared Goff Midian sends in a tip and says, Hi, John, I know you focus on movies, but would you consider doing a one-time live stream after the Super Bowl? I feel like <coughs> many of your fans like football, <coughs> and it would be cool 
to hear people's thoughts after the game. I think this will be a great game. I think it's going to be a great game, too. That's not a bad idea. Uh, I will run that one by John. As a matter of fact, do I have my phone with me? Um, I'm going to read this into, I'm going I'm to send John a text. Uh-oh, I don't have my phone with me. Uh, my phone is over there. I can't do it. I was going to do it live. I'm sorry. But I will make sure that I will ask John about a live Super Bowl stream. Garden Variety Vagabond, who started this shindig, says, You did not give your ideas for best original song. A big one, as Lin-Manuel Miranda is against Billie Eilish and Phineas O'Connell for not just the Oscar, but for his EGOT. He may have a better shot for song over best director. I hope he doesn't miss both miss both shots. I think, look, I think that um I think that No Time to Die is gonna win the song, but you know what? I kind of want to see Lin Manuel Miranda get it because I didn't think Tick Tick Boom got its due at the Oscars, but um we'll see. He's gonna get you know what, even if he doesn't get it now, Lin Manuel Miranda, mark my words, is gonna get his he's gonna be an EGOT. Maybe not this year, but sometime. Card Variety Vagabond says, team, the question of the Oscars 2021 was, should there be one or should there be one or should 22 be for both years? So how would that alter some of your 2022 picks? And do you think now that having 2021 and 22 picks together crowds out some great films? Yes. To be honest, I think it's good that we had one in 2021. There are too many good films in 2022. 2020, well, 2021 was a, okay, so the Oscars for 2020 were in 2021. The films of 2021 were pretty damn good. We saw a lot of great work. I would hate that they were both smashed together. I think, that, oh no, what was that? Is that my phone falling on the ground? I think my phone just fell on the ground. I hope it didn't crack, damn it. Um, I I uh maybe I maybe I moved that like Charlie in in uh, Firestarter. Um I, I I'm glad it I'm glad it went the way it went. I really am. I think I think I think it went the right way. I think it went the right way. Uh Eileen B says, Hi John and Company, first time commentator that I've been watching every day for five years. Well, thank you. Or it's Ellie. It's Ellie, not Eileen. What I was thinking Billy Eilish. Let's call her Ellie B. Ellie B. Uh, hi, John and company. First time commentator, though I've been watching every day for five years. I feel like we're close to hitting critical mass with Marvel shows. Over 10 titles coming in 2022, 23, not even counting movies. Wow, this is one of eight. Wow. Logistically, I feel like it's asking too much of the general audience to keep track and follow all of these shows, especially if they are too interconnected and then subsequently appear in films. Narratively, I also feel the world is getting too complicated. The multiverse is a hard concept for general audiences to one, understand, and two, care much about, since the stakes are far beyond what we can relate to. I'm a huge sci-fi fan, but even I switch off once time travel and the multiverses are introduced. I just can't make myself care. I'm interested in Moon Knight. Interested in Moon Knight? Yes, you are. Miss Marvel and Ironheart, as I'm not familiar with those characters. You will be. A secret invasion could be good, but also risks overcomplicating the MCU, especially if big retcons or identity twists are added. I'm actually looking forward to Armor Wars most, since I've always preferred the tech-based heroes. Real world stakes, and I love me some Rhodey. It's the same reason I love Falcon and Winter Soldier way more than WandaVision and Loki. I like the added depth to the characters we already knew and the thematic depth to the world of the MCU more than any amount of magic and timey wiminess All empires collapse when they overexpand, get, comp get complacent, perhaps a little arrogant, and don't provide sufficient resources to keep track of things. I'd rather quality over quantity, uh, but business demands quantity. I feel phase four and five may break the MCU. It reminds me of Bilbo's line from Lord of the, Re Lord of the Rings. I feel stretched like butter scraped over too much bread. Great line. Thoughts? Boy, Ellie, that's a lot. That's a lot to unpack. Well, here's the thing. I too worry, especially after Loki, that the multiverse pushed the Marvel universe too far. Because we still the the reason that the Marvel universe works as well as it does is because we can focus on the main timeline. We can focus on the characters. I like the history that's being developed. But once you bring in, I thought Spider-Man, look, they made into the Spider-Verse, which is wonderful. That was the first time we saw the multiverse in its glory. And then 
we got a little bit of it in Endgame going through the quantum realm, but that was more time travel than multiverse. Then when you get to Loki, the idea of the multiverse and WandaVision had a little of that in that sort of. Um, but then, of course, Loki just blew it all up. And then No Way Home. It is, it is a lot to keep track of. I think so far, assuming we'll see what they do with Loki. My whole thing with Loki was it was too fantastical. I know it's weird to say with Thanos and with all the superheroes, but the idea of the multiverse, I think they went too far. I know they're introducing Kang, but I think if they kept with timelines instead of multiverses, it might have been easier, Like because we, we have more of a sense of understanding that as far as our pop culture is concerned. But I think you're right. I think there is a danger. Uh, like at the end of Star Wars, we've analyzed their attack, sir, and there is a danger. Um, so I... I think you're not wrong, but on the other hand, I think that they know it. I think Kevin, Kevin Feige, Victoria Alonso, and Louis Esposito, I think they're smart, and they know they, they, they're they pushing it as far as they can go. Then they have to pull it back. They have to pull it back, whether it becomes Secret Wars on Battle World or whatever, however they're going to do that. They have to pull it back because it's just, I think you're right, it's just getting a little too crazy, too crazy. And I, I think, you know, you've got to pull it back and put the reality back into it but we'll see i mean i don't think it's going to break marvel but after all i mean we're we're what is so multiverse of madness is the 28th marvel movie and then thor love and thunder is 29 and we're going to get to our 30th marvel movie this year 31 and then you've got moon knight you've got miss marvel whatever other series are going to come out there's a lot we're going to be into our 30s. I mean, there's a lot of TV shows, even 10, 10 episode, three season shows that haven't got that many. So hopefully cooler heads are keeping it all straight. Let's hope they don't break it. But the, I think the the possibility is there. I, I have faith the creative team will bring it back so it doesn't happen. But it could. I don't think your fears are unfounded. Uh, J. Meister 25 sends in a tip and says, so... Sony believes the words brutal and emotional don't sell movies. I remind you that No Way Home made $1.7 billion without China, but they're going to get on Holland's case about it? Did y'all not take notes when Infinity War and Endgame made dollars? Idiots. Well, remember, you're dealing with these publicly held corporations, and they have, they have, they have, we have research and analysis that says you can't use the words brutal or emotional because it drives audiences away. What do they do? Stand outside a supermarket and, you know, poll women shopping for uh, the family meals at noon on a Wednesday? I mean, it's so weird, the the, the idea. I think I, I you're right, but, you know, they've got research and analytics that say if you use the word brutal or emotional, somehow it's going to turn people off from the movies they want to see. Which is so stupid. <laughs> Dude, someone says brutal and emotional, sign me up. I'm there. Uh, B. Wayne. No, I can't. B. Wayne, you're Wayne. B. Wayne NY says, hey, guys, just watched the new Reacher series starring Titans and Smallville actor Alan Richson. I really liked it. Richson is WWE huge with fighting skills to match. Gotta love a guy who tells someone how he's going to kick their ass. I think season two is a lock. Well, B. Wayne from New York, you understand. After three days, Amazon renewed it. Look at that. It's like that Star Trek episode with the giant green hand. Uh, yeah. So I, 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 it's renewed. I don't know what book they're going to do. I don't know if they're going in order, but I, I'm with you. I loved it. I thought it was great. I love it. Joseph Michael says, if Lightyear makes a decent chunk of money during its theatrical run, will Potato Head JPEG finally have the cojones to release more Pixar films in theaters again? <laughs> Joseph Michael, I think it's a shame that we have not been getting the kind of movies we've been, we, why, why, why can I not see Pixar movies in the theater? God damn it. We better get Lightyear because it looks so good. And the design, it looks, it just looks like such a great theatrical experience. Um, hopefully. I mean, I, I, I just, I don't know why. I mean, I guess they feel that animated films, they bring the family audiences because, you know, kids watch those newfangled animations over and over again. 
I don't even know what voice I'm doing here, but you know, I'm amusing myself. And if I'm amusing myself, you guys are amused too, right? I, you know, I don't know. I think it was really silly to do that. Not, wasn't good business. Jonathan says, kind of weird in Canto got a song nomination, but got the least memorable song nominated. To each their own, I guess. Also, no songs from West Side Story is weird. There's only a few original songs in West Side Story. Uh, because remember, it's from a Broadway show, and most of those songs, when you're a jet, you're a jet all the way to your first cigarette to your last dying day, um, that they were all from a Broadway show that was also in a musical. But they did have some the musical version directed by Robert Wise and Jerome Robbins, which is from 61? I think. Uh, so there was not a lot of new music, new music, which means it wouldn't have qualified for the Oscars. A Canadian mounted. <laughs> a Canadian mounted. Hey, John and crew, yesterday I learned something new. A new fact. Harrison Ford was born in 1942. This means he was born before he was in Star Wars, Indiana Jones, and American Graffiti. This never occurred to me. Did you know about this intriguing fact? Well, I have to tell you a Canadian mounted. I did know that Harrison Ford was actually born before he was in Star Wars, Indiana Jones, and American Graffiti. He was also born before he was in Apocalypse Now, but Apocalypse Now came out after Star Wars and American Graffiti, but before Indiana Jones. So, yeah, that's a very fascinating fact you provided for us, and I want to thank you for saying that, a Canadian mounted, because I don't think I would have thought of it. I don't, I, yeah, I wouldn't have. Uh, William Bangs <laughs> says, Hey, John, I'm hoping to be able to tell my favorite actress she literally saved my life. But I know fans are always saying stuff like this. If I never get a response to my letters, how should I process that? And should I stop trying at some point? William Bangs, here's the thing if you're trying to get a response from a celebrity, do not take it personally if they don't write you back. A lot of the time, they never even see these kinds of letters or communications because they have other people doing that work for them. And those people don't know which letters they should keep and which letters they should throw away. Don't take it personally. Just know that one day, you might you might uh, um, go somewhere or you might say someone's doing an autograph signing at a convention and you're going to finally get an opportunity to speak to a celebrity that meant a lot to you. The way that you speak to them is going to be very, very important. Now, here's what I would suggest. If you meet this celebrity and they're important to you, be very formal. Um, hello, Mr. Cruz. It is, listen, it's a great honor to meet you. And, and hopefully, here's what you should do. Here's what you shouldn't do. Don't go, I love Top Gun. I love Maverick. What a character. Talk to him or whatever your favorite celebrity, whoever they are about something that might not necessarily be at the top, tip of everyone's tongue, but something you really, really like. Like you could say, Mr. Cruz, uh, it's a great honor to meet you. I just want to say that I'm a really huge fan of Vanilla Sky, and I love your performance in it. And I also love Jerry Maguire, but there was something about Vanilla Sky that really touched me and helped me get through a really difficult time in my life. And I think that um, that movie and your performance uh, really moved me. You know what? Mr. Cruz will say, that's great, man. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Not enough people talk to me about Vanilla Sky. Do something like that. <clears throat> Sir Ivan Bennett says, sends in a tip and says, Oscar noms are out. However, has anyone seen Nine Days with Winston Duke, Zazie Beetz, and Benedict Wong? It's a moving, quiet, different type of film. You should all watch it. It's great. I've not seen that, but it's 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 about these characters that have to figure out what they're going to do for the afterlife or something. It looks great. Right up my alley. I have not seen it yet. Uh, I really want to see that. I keep forgetting about that. Uh, also, uh, Swan Song with Mahershala Ali. It's a different kind of a movie, but it's also about somebody who's going to die and having to deal with their clones so the clone can go on. It's really, really good. Reese C. Film says... I believe that baby Toyota will be the user of the dark blade. I mean, that would be great. Turn him into a bad guy. Love it. Love it. Love it. Tomas sends in a tip and says, over under 20%, Lerman's Elvis movie. We'll have a spot at the Super Bowl. I think the movie title will be Elvis Taking Care of Business. 
Taking care of business was a term he used in the 70s, especially with his band. It sounds cool and works as a movie title. The only thing is, when you say taking care of business, I think of it as someone else's song. Taking care of business every way. Uh, taking care of business every day. Taking care of business. Working overtime. Whatever. I, I don't even. But maybe. I mean, I would love. I can't wait to see this movie. I love Baz Luhrmann's work. So I a biopic about Elvis done in Baz Luhrmann style. Come on. Who doesn't want to see that? I'm in. Count me in. Count me in. Ethan Holgate says, hi, John and Rob. If he's there, I I am totally here. Can you believe that? I'm totally here. Um, I got to be honest. I'm very surprised Shang-Chi got nominated for Best VFX. I thought the VFX were great, but not half as good as Eternals, in my opinion. I thought their VFX were 10 times better in terms of detail, but of, of course, but, but, uh, I think that's it. But, I don't know. Um... You know what? I, I think it comes down to, I thought the visual effects in Eternals were quite beautiful. and um, But I think they, the creatures, you know, the deviants were kind of CGI, but I really loved a lot of what was going on in there. I thought the celestial scenes were amazing. They really gave you a sense of scope and awe and wonder. But I think there was just more of the stuff in Shang-Chi that's traditional. And I think the effects, people might have like looked at the deviants and looked maybe down on the film a bit. Not sure, but maybe... But um, but in terms of detail, yeah, I would I I don't disagree. Uh, Dark Gate eighty nine says Nolan's Oppenheimer is my most anticipated movie of next year with a cast of Cillian Murphy, Emily Blunt, Robert Downey Jr., Matt Damon, Josh Hartnett, and Rami Malek. This has got to be the most stacked Nolan film ever made. What do you think? I, I I agree. I'm really looking forward to anything Christopher Nolan does, and I wouldn't be surprised if he goes to someone's military and goes, hey. Can we just really set off a nuke and can I can I can I shoot it for real? I mean, by the way, I'd kind of want to see that. Like, can't we can't you guys? I don't know how much a nuclear bomb costs, but can we just set one off for the movie? <laughs> you can look at the budget. Nuclear explosion. Ten million dollars. Probably a lot more than that, but like, why not? Doesn't somebody want to test some nukes? I mean, they talk about Iran just built a new intercontinental ballistic missile or something, or maybe not intercontinental, but one that travels far. Like, maybe you can go to Iran and go, yo, can we do a little nuclear test and let me shoot it? I need it for Oppenheimer. Uh, but I look forward to it. I think it's going to be great. Why not? What a cast. It's pretty stacked. Um, hey, John and Rob, HBO Max just announced that Tokyo Vice, starring Ken Watanabe and Ansel Elgort, will premiere April 7th. It's a 1990s set Tokyo crime thriller. Michael Mann is the EP and is directing the pilot. Are you guys excited for it? Not only, oh wait, who? I don't even know who said that. John, pardon me, Don J asked this question. Don J, thank you for asking that question. Don J, let me tell you, Tokyo Vice is based on a book that I read. Fascinating. It is absolutely fascinating. I've heard that the, the series is loosely based on the book, but the book is fascinating. The whole look at Japanese culture and the Yakuza and big business and honor and uh, read it i was completely fascinated by this book it's it's an incredible read cannot wait for the show um i think this would be great harley's husband says hi john and company you speak the truth on the dangers of funkos <laughs> i had zero then finally gave in last november to get my coveted margot harley from the Suicide Squad, and now 35, including four Margo and Harleys, <laughs> and eight more on order, not counting the, Bat the Batman ones I mean to get. Look, look, Harley's husband, I don't know what to tell you. Don't blame us. All I know is they multiply. Same is true of Hot Toys, man. You Dangerous. Dangerous. You got to stay away. Stay away. Anonymous says, hi again. My tip comment that was missed was in regards to a guy who brought up Jumper on Monday's show. Oh, they did make a TV series spinoff on YouTube TV with a female lead in the same universe. She was struggling to figure out her powers in such great show. You know what? I totally forgot about that. I kind of liked Jumper. I mean, it wasn't the best, but I kind of liked it. You know, it's kind of dope. But I forgot about that. I remember that now. Uh, I never watched it. Maybe there was a reason. Maybe there was a reason. The Image Wizard sends in a tip and says, 
I'm gonna I'm gonna say this as he's written it. I got my Batman IMAX fan screening ticket. So stoked! He he wrote it just like that. I hope everyone else is going. Doesn't care if I'm wearing an adult diaper. <laughs> well, it depends. You know, it depends how much you fill your diaper up. Are you going to interfere with the enjoyment of the film? If I smell anything less than popcorn in a movie theater, I go a little berserk. But you know, just kidding. I have a strong bladder. Me too. Uh, I've had to go this entire chat, and I'm still here right now. I haven't gotten up. That's how strong my bladder is. I look at it. I look at it. You know what? Here's. I've always thought of when you drink a lot, like you have a big Diet Coke or something or whatever you like to drink in a movie theater, and you drink a lot of it, and you have to go. Holding it in, I feel, is like working out. I feel like I'm losing weight kind of by holding the bladder, holding it all up. I know some doctor's like, well, Rob, that's really terrible for your health. I understand that, but in my own mind, I'm justifying. I'm like, I'm not getting up. Got to hold it. Hold it till, you know. And now you can't even hold it till the credits. You got to wait. You have to wait to the end credits to see if something happens. I mean, I'm sure people be like, well, Rob, you know, I can run out. I can take a bit of a waz, and I can come back and still see the post-title post title sequences. Not in Marvel movies. There's two. You're going to miss the first one. Don't do that. I hope you have a strong bladder, but yes, the image wizard. We're going. It's going to be great. Mark Nettow says, my take on Lightyear is that this film is the inspirational film Andy saw that the Toy Story Buzz is based on. Buzz is basically a Funko Pop for Andy's era. Looks to me possibly a number of sequels. In my opinion, uh, I hope. Oh, in my in my in my opinion, I hope the Book of Boba Fett finale works. Well, as you might have heard me say today on the show, I thought it was McClunky. That's what I thought. I did. Uh, whether it was or not, I leave that up to you. <laughs> Cat and dog owner says, John, I love your show, but you calling cats alligator food? I'm distraught. I'm not sure why you would normalize cat hate, but it's a trend I've seen in Hollywood. I wanted to watch Only Murders in the Building and got to episode three when a cat was frozen. Steve Martin broke off its paw, put it in his pocket, and let it defrost. Some demented writer thought that was funny. I quit watching. If it happened to a dog, the show would be canceled. Whatever cheap humor came after that wasn't worth the trauma. Cat and dog owner says this. I grew up as a cat lover. I've had cats my whole life. I live in a cat and dog house. We have two doodles. Gilbert is a 70-pound Bernadoodle, 25% Bernese Mountain Dog, 75% Poodle. Tallulah is an Irish Doodle, 50% Irish Setter, 50% Poodle. And we have Skippy John Jones, kind of a tabby. Uh, she's kind of fat. We love cats. I love cats in my household. Dogs and cats living together. There is not mass hysteria. It works. It works well. I love cats. John's scared of them. He's scared. I'm not going to, I'm going to, you can't hear me doing this, but you know it. Campy is totally terrified of cats. He can't deal with it. He's scared of them. He knows that when he's sleeping, they're going to walk up on his chest and they're going to suck the breath out of his lungs and he'll be gone. He's terrified of cats. That's what's happening. He tries to have all this bravado, but shh, don't tell him I said that. So anyway, there you go. Shy, <laughs> Shy Potsy says, hey, John and crew, regarding a brief conversation that took place on the show a few days ago about Captain America lifting Mjolnir in Avengers Age of Ultron, it sounded like Rob, as well as yourself, are in agreement that the more you watch Avengers Age of Ultron, the better it gets. I'm in total agreement. I really like Avengers Age of Ultron. Now, tr full disclosure, I'm a huge Ultron fan. I love Ultron. I loved in the Kurt Busiek, George Prez, Avengers, Avengers issue 22, when they're fighting Ultron, he's killed millions of people or whatever. The Avengers fight all the way to literally Ultron's door, and you have that great panel, Ultron, we would have words with thee. Look that up. Just put that phrase in Google. The, the image will come up. It's a small image, but it's a great image. George Prez, the great George Prez, who uh, is fighting terminal cancer right now, but one of my favorite comic artists of all time. Uh, Shy Potsy goes on to say, I've had a very similar experience with it. Therefore, I'm curious what that looks like for you. What elements of the movie stand out now that maybe didn't the first couple of times around? Well, I have to say, Shy Potsy, I always loved it. I, I, look, I love the Avengers uh, scene when they're having the dinner party at night. When you're, you're seeing the Avengers let it all hang out, they're getting to know each other. I like watching Tony Stark and Banner work together. I like the opening sequence, that long single shot when they're attacking 
uh, the base, the Hydra base, I, 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 all of it. I mean, I think that the end gets a little. I, I think the problem is I don't think the the end lands as well as it should. But the rest of the movie, the character, I love it because the character interplay. It's not just superhero stuff. You're watching these characters. I think the humanity of them comes out more in Age of Ultron than it does in uh, the other Avengers movies. But I really like it. Shy Potsy goes on to say, one of two. Something that has always bothered me in the MCU is the recasting of Hulk from Ed Norton to Mark Ruffalo. Keeping in mind, I'm a bit weird about stuff like this and acknowledging that it's very minor in the grand scheme of things. Shy Potsy goes on to say, do you think Kevin Feige would ever make it a point to provide a fix for continuity? For example, in Doctor Strange 2, maybe we see Edward Norton's Hulk implying that the 2008 Hulk movie was a multiversal Hulk aside from the main MCU timeline. Hmm. I could see that maybe happening, maybe, but you know, it's, it doesn't bother me because it's like Rhodey being played by Terrence Howard and then being played by Don Cheadle. You know, sometimes you just have to go with it. And I guess as a veteran of James Bond movies, seeing James Bond recast, I, it doesn't bother me as much, but um, I just, you know, I look at, Ed, even though they don't look anything alike, I just see Edward Norton as a younger version of Banner. But I like that idea. I think that you know, why not do that? But I think also I understand for, you know, if, if, if like, if it bothers you, if you're, you know, anal retentive, like I am, like if I'm organizing my books on a shelf, I don't like it when the spines are all the same, except one. I'm like, come on, man. Why can't you make all the spines the same? Why do you got to do that? I don't understand. It's because you know why? Because sometimes someone comes in 20 years after the fact or 10 years or five years later, and now we're going to change it to this. They don't understand that we, we want that continuity, but um, I don't think it's a bad idea. I think I think people might actually, they might welcome that. To be honest, they might welcome it. That could be kind of cool. Matthew Grant says, for some reason, I've never seen The Godfather. Not a lot of people haven't, but I understand. It's just because it's my favorite movie, it's no, you don't have to. Well, I just got my A-list ticket for the 50-year anniversary with AMC and Dolby. I'm going to see The Godfather for the first time in a movie theater. I'm pretty stoked. Matthew Grant, you should be. Now, let me just say something. <clears throat> I'm not trying to – the movie does not need me to excuse it. But what I would say is you have to remember it came out in 1972, and we've seen many a mafia movie now. We've seen Goodfellas. We've seen The Sopranos. We've seen all kinds of things. I mean, Goodfellas, the, the film pyrotechnics are – they're amazing. But when Coppola was trying to make the movie, one of the things I love about The Godfather is because it's set in the late 40s and early 50s, mostly the late 40s. Um, the great thing that I love about The Godfather, as Coppola said, it is a movie about a king and his three sons. Yes, it is set in the world of late 40s, New York, and the mafia, Cosa Nostra, and all that. But really, it's about a father. It's very Shakespearean. It is not action-packed. It's it's very much an intellectual exercise. In a way, it's almost like Succession. You know, there's a lot of the show Succession in The Godfather. But watch it. It's also, what I love about the film is, it's about the immigrant experience in America. It's also about a man, a good man, who ends up through circumstances having to take on the family business, which isn't always good, is actually criminal, and yet, it's foisted upon him, uh, uh, circumstances has foisted it upon him. So, uh, and then he has to deal with it. And it's really interesting. And it has a lot to say about the human condition. I hope you enjoy it. It's one of my favorite movies ever made. Sean Day says, hi, John. Have you seen the news? Peter Dinklage bashes Disney for remaking a live action Snow White using stereotype dwarf or little person roles. What are your thoughts? Well, we've talked about this a lot on the show, Sean. I look at it this way. Peter Dinklage, as a little person himself, has a point. You know, he's watched little people marginalized. He is one. He's felt it. You can't tell him he hasn't because he has. And he looks at something like the movie's called Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. I get it. The condition that he has, that he was born with, um, sometimes it's called dwarfism or whatever. And I think he's absolutely right in saying, look, how far have we come? Have we not come far enough? Totally agree with him. That said, I know I'm saying I'm going to give you a but. But as we talked about on the show, in fantasy literature, whether it was Tolkien or Dungeons and Dragons or even Snow White, 
the idea of dwarves to me are are fantasy characters and the seven dwarves are delightful they help snow white they take her in they give her a place of safety now i get what peter dinklage is saying but i don't think the portrayal of the seven dwarves in snow white is an adverse or detrimental portrayal of these characters um but then again, I am not a little person. I I don't know what it's like to walk in his shoes. So he might have a point. I would say this, though. I would say the characters in Snow White are the righteous ones. They represent good. They represent family. And they represent um, brotherhood. And they represent a safe space, a place where you can go and be protected and be shown love, which is what's something that Snow White needs in her life. But I understand where he's coming from. I can't fault him for his opinion. So, but it, it you know, it's a tough, it's a tough call. It is not for me to say or tell Peter Dinklage whether what he says is right or wrong. He has his opinion based on his own lived in experience. And I certainly haven't had his experience, so I couldn't nearly comment on it. But I don't, on one hand, I, I, I see where he's coming from. On another hand, I would say that these are, these are fantasy characters. Like, I, I don't think that watching something like The Little Mermaid is necessarily um, somehow besmirching other mermaids in the world. But I totally understand where he's coming from. And I think that it's very much a conversation worth having and rethinking. Uh, hey, John, I thought I liked the Jack Reacher movie, but damn, this show may have killed it for me. This story and Reacher make me want to read and listen to the books. He's a badass, way more violent and freaking imposing as fuck. Sorry, Tommy. Well, <clears throat> Boris, I have to say that the Jack Reacher books are a joy to read. I love these series. There's so many. I read the Dave Robichaux books, the Heaven's Prisoners with Alec Baldwin, or um, <clears throat> the... the um, in the Electric Mist with Tommy Lee Jones. I love Andrew Vox's Burke series. Those are great. But the Jack Reacher books, the Lee Child, they're by Lee Child. They're so good. You'll love them. They're really, 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 really good. So, yeah, I, I think you're going to like them, listen to them, read them. They're a joy. Billy Green says, The Book of Boba Fett finale was holiday special level bad. Or as I like to say, McClunky. The whole series overall was a disappointment. Please help me understand how this happened with Favreau and Filoni, the saviors of Star Wars at the helm. Help me, John Campia. You're my only hope. Billy Green, you know the old story or the old book, the old children's book? It was my favorite when I was a kid. Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. And at the end, he tells his mom this, and his mom's like, well, some days are like that. I know it's not. It's There's no solace in it. I I found the book of Boba Fett to be inexplicable. I, I talked about it today on the show. I'm like, look, Fennec Shan has to explain to you, well, we've got Blacker Stanton's here, the Vespa, Mos Espa Vespas are here, we got the Gamorrean guards over here. Like, <laughs> uh, that is not a defense. Why are we in the city? Let's go back to our palace. Let's go back to our helms deep and fend off. Like, let me ride the Rancor in instead of, oh, I don't know, flying the Slave One in? It wasn't good. I, I can't even begin to tell you why it went this way. I don't understand. I don't understand. They sat in an edit band like, why would Boba Fett think that his armor is inside the Sarlacc pit? Why, knowing that there's tentacles inside the Sarlacc that can come out and grab people, would you want to get the slave one that close to it? I don't know. It, it is, it's, as they said in, uh, in uh, Shakespeare in Love, it's mystery. I don't know. Billy, I think you and I are just going to have to wait and read some post-mortem on BuzzFeed that's going to explain, you know, 10 things that went wrong in the book of Boba Fett and what Favreau and Filoni said about them. I don't know if that'll ever happen, but my God, I think it should because they owe me, damn it. Tashi Victor says, I'm really worried about Mandalorian season three. Book of Boba Fett was disjointed and unfocused, especially after Mando arrived. Grogu's story last season was about getting him to a Jedi to train, but now he doesn't really have a story. I agree. Well, two. I don't think they should have brought him into the show. Instead, have him and Luke train in season three, then make the ultimatum. This would give us time to see Mando trying to redeem himself as a Mandalorian, perhaps giving us a crisis of faith from Din. Toshi Victor, I I agree with you. I would love to have seen uh, Grogu train. We'd we kept going back to his training. We could expand and ex uh, uh, on the Jedi training scene, see it blown up much more than we saw in Empire. Luke was really training Grogu. 
He's learning about the living force. And at the end of the episode, at the end of the season, you realize Grogu's heart isn't in it. Luke realized, I mean, it's happened so quickly. They, they, these massive story beats that they could spend an entire season on just, well, let's do it in an afternoon. I hate that. So I don't think you're wrong, man. I think, I think what you just described, I'd love to see that show. <clears throat> um, three, uh, when you go on to say, perhaps giving us a crisis of faith from Din, which would have meant more with him not having Grogu. We could have seen we could have seen potentially choosing Grogu over the Creed. I also think Boba was shoved to the side in a show that's supposed to teach us about who he is. Disney Plus for me has struck out twice. I don't think you're wrong. It's uh, very strange. I don't get it. Honestly, I really don't understand it. It's baffling to me, and I I don't know I don't know why. Um, Spicy Mayo says, what a complete embarrassment for Star Wars fans as a whole. That finale was a disaster. Rodriguez better not touch any future Star Wars projects. How do you make combat and action scenes feel so clunky and slow? I also blame Favreau for that writing. I agree. I thought, um, Spicy Mayo goes on and says, after the disastrous sequel trilogy, Mando seasons one and two were great, but this show just fell flat. This show destroyed Boba Fett's legacy and made him look idiotic. Cad frickin' Bane needed to be introduced from the start. Got rid of a great character too fast. I agree with everything you said. I I find all of the decisions made in this show inexplicable. I would have sat down with John Favreau for an afternoon and said, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Let's do this, this, this. It's, uh, it, it's strange to me because, you know, Star Wars is a riff on classical storytelling. Joseph Campbellian storytelling. And I, I saw a lot of gobbledygook in this and it doesn't make any sense really to be honest the mandalorian episodes of book of boba fett were fine but they weren't really about boba fett so to me i liked i it, it wasn't it was imperfect but my favorite episode was the second one the whole tuscan storyline it made sense to me it was a little clunky but at the end of the day it worked i thought it worked and i did like bryce dallas howard's episode but i'm like even that seemed small like you're watching the armor and you're watching paz <laughs> his gloria which is the, that's not that um i always want to say Vesalia, heavy mando for you hot toys fans out there it's just the three of them fighting over the dark saber like really it was it just wasn't so spicy mail book of boba fett was not spicy and i'm now spicy about it so not good disney gifts by bryce sends in a tip and says sir geo sir robert how you doing Disney gifts by Bryce. I appreciate the opportunity to hold your attention for a moment. In the grand tradition of Spider-Man No Way Home, Die Hard, and Iron Man 3, I must know is Batman Returns a Christmas movie. Yes. Yes, I think it is. I mean, first of all, it takes place at Christmas. There's a lot of Christmassy things in it. And it really kind of is about family. It is absolutely a Christmas movie. I mean, John will probably disagree with me. But... Um, that's okay. That's what makes a lot. That's what makes uh, spicy life worth living. Uh, love that. So yeah, it is. It is absolutely a Christmas movie. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Don't do it. James McDonald sends in a tip. One or two. I have an idea for a Star Wars what if episode. What if Anakin never stopped Mace Windu from killing Palpatine? That's a good one. I think because the Jedi Order would have control of the Senate and the power of the Jedi would be too much by drawing the jedi peacekeepers into the war turning them into generals i think anakin would still turn dark or mace would not trust the government again to give up power the republic turns on the jedi anyways palpatine palpatine still wins that's a great idea james that would have been very sophisticated and it would have elevated the story of the prequels more i i like that idea um i wish we had it and look i really think as someone who loves Star Wars, someone who saw Empire Strikes Back 26 times, first run in the theater. What I feel that Star Wars is lacking is great storytelling. Strip away the fact that you're in the Star Wars universe. Give me heat. Give me Robert De Niro and Al Pacino and heat. Give me that story, but set it in the Star Wars universe. But make it that adult. Why? Why I feel like they're writing these stories that they think, well, we're going to make it so uh, four-year-olds can understand. I'm like, What? It's just not good, man. It's not good. It's been bothering me a lot. 
Um, but I like this idea. I think your idea is really sound. It's really, really good. Buddy the Christ sends in a tip and says, Book of Boba Fett proves something I've been saying for years. Boba Fett is the most overrated Star Wars character ever. That being said, I thoroughly enjoyed this series. This is the most intriguing Boba Fett has ever been, at least to me. I agree, but it wasn't intriguing enough. Buddy the Christ goes on to say, I also realize, watching Book of Boba Fett, a lot of Star Wars fans overanalyze everything and have a stick up their bunghole, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Uh, been a Star Wars fan my whole life, but I don't feel this need to put the Boba Fett uh, on a pedestal. The Fett on a pedestal. Uh, just enjoy the ride. Well, here's, buddy, here's the thing. For me, it comes down to storytelling. It comes down to characters and storytelling. Now, we know what are great stories. What I find uh, upsetting about the book of Boba Fett is what we want is we want the same. I, I bring up heat because I'm only thinking about it. But whether it's I want to see a Martin Scorsese level of consideration for the story being told the way he tells you could you could make Goodfellas, but set it in the Star Wars universe. I feel that what we're seeing when we see a, a, a Vespa gang and it's underdeveloped, when we see Fennec Shang going, well, Black Stanton is standing over here, and you see Black Stanton when they're about to fight a war, standing in the middle of a street, vulnerable to anyone with a blaster or a cannon or something, and you're like, why aren't you hiding? Why aren't you on a rooftop with a sniper rifle waiting to pick dudes off? Why are you standing? When I see even Black or Stanton, when I see him standing there, it's like with enough overwhelming force, somebody will take you out. Someone will fly a speeder into you. How are you going to move? You're a Wookiee. If someone's going to do a kamikaze run or jump off a speeder and hit the accelerator, how are you going to get away? It, it, you look at it and you're like, nobody would act this way. And I feel that's the problem with a lot of modern Star Wars is suddenly the characters are acting like idiots. And the plotting, the plot, actual plot machinations are really dumb, you know, and, and it, it's inexplicable to me. Why, why do you not put enough consideration? I'm, I'm not saying that people are always like, well, Rob, why do you expect Star Wars to be like uh, scripted, like Breaking Bad or like Ozark? Because those stories make sense. People might act crazy stuff happens, but they don't act out of character. Boba Fett chasing around a droid through a kitchen. That undermines the credibility of that character. Boba Fett would hang back, wait till and just the robot makes its appearance and shoot him. He's not going to pick up a, a a kitchen robot or droid and go, "I am Boba Fett." What is that kitchen robot supposed to know who he is? No. And I think that the the big problem is the storytelling is just not where it should be. Well, buddy, the Christ, you're the last. You're the last question man it's uh we're almost two hours into this i want to say well thanks it's time to end this first of all i want to thank all of the people that generously support this channel through super chats and and tips thank you so much it makes all of this possible uh i know that chris i know that ray i know that aaron and especially john and myself really thank you for taking the time we love your thoughtful questions we love to hear from you we love this community it's fantastic I love being a part of it. I want to thank you all for participating again and watching these companion videos. Sometimes I feel like an, I'm an interloper. As I look around at all of this technology, I feel like I should be like Alan Cumming and Goldeneye and I am invincible. I know that's a weird deep cut. People are like, what? But, you know, I could take the world over from here. You should see this technology that John has. It's amazing. But on that note, I want to thank you for watching this John Campia show mailbag and I will be back again at some point in the future, probably the very near future, and I will see you back here. I would say what John says, you know, bye bye but I always like to say, remember, every person you meet has a story to tell that you have yet to hear, and all you have to do is listen. And with that, I say to all of you, have a better day. <laughs>